as vozes do professor. Teachers' Voices. Welcome to Teachers' Voices. I'm your host, Nina Alonso, and this is a special episode to celebrate World Education Day. As in other bonus episodes, we will mainly focus on sharing concrete tools and resources. In this episode, I am joined by Sarah Horley from Teachers for the Planet. Sarah, I will let you introduce yourself in a minute, but first, let me tell you about where I'm recording from today, because I'm so excited about it. I know you will all miss my dog, Indy, in the background. I'm not with her because I'm talking to you from an amazing girls' school in a biosphere reserve in the Maracayu Forest in Paraguay, almost in the intersection between Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. Hey girls, say hi. Vamos, chicas. Hola, somos de Maracayu. When you finish today's episode, go and look at the show notes for links and some visual content, in addition to the free tools, guides, and resources from our guests, You will also see some cool stuff about the Maracayu School. You might remember my interview with Sonia Sanabria, the principal of this school, on a previous episode called How Gender Equality in Education Can Benefit All Children. If you want to know more about this school, listen to that episode and look at the Teachers for the Planet repository where Sonia and the school are showcased. Back to the point. Sarah, thanks so much for your patience and for doing this with me. Hi, Nina. It's very nice to see you. So it's a very exciting time at the Learning Planet at the moment. We're just launching our Learning Planet Festival, which has been running for a number of years. It's a celebration of education and lifelong learning. And there's a real focus on environmental and societal challenges that are happening at the moment. I have seen the program of the festival and it's so varied and interesting. Where are you now? I'm joining you from Zurich and I can see out the window a very snowy scene And I can just, if I look around some buildings, see Lake Zurich, which is looking a bit gray today. That sounds very different to the landscape I can see now, actually. Today, we will be going back and forth from the Americas to Europe. So you are from the Teachers for the Planet, but I believe you are also a former teacher. I was. I was a science teacher for 10 years in London. I'm the program manager for Teachers for the Planet, which is an organization or program that runs across three organizations, Teach for All. Aga Khan Foundation and the Learning Planet Institute. And we have two main aims. We are looking to promote community of practice through online and in-person events where we come together to improve the quality of climate change education. And we also are raising up the voice of teachers who are already doing amazing climate change education work. This year, we are really proud that we took 100 teacher-led climate change education solutions from those teachers, put them in an online repository and took them to COP28 to show them to policymakers to inspire action at the policy level. I know that was very exciting and I'm thrilled that this podcast with its inspiring stories from teachers working for sustainable development is featured on the repository. Sarah, can you tell me about our guests today? So the, the online repository has examples of teachers from across the world, from all different contexts. And today we have three teachers just going to talk a bit more about their work so that you can really get an insight into the sort of stories that are contained in the repository. Thanks, Sarah. We are then going to start our journey visiting one of these teachers. We first traveled to Switzerland, where Astrid Hugli connected with me from the Alps. Astrid appears in the camera with a happy face and she's in a wooden cabin and in the back I can see some red stars stuck in the walls. She explains that she and her family had gone to their mountain cabin during the Christmas break and they had not taken down all the decorations yet. Astrid, you're using your teaching practice a scientific but accessible game called Climate Risk. We will put all the links to Climate Risk in the show notes and You have also created your own model, which is now being piloted. Can you tell us about how your model works and how it is inspired in the climate risk? I'm a part, I'm secondary school teacher. And the other part, I work for an European climate project. I'm responsible for the education program. I develop a model, a CO2 model called How Does CO2 Affects Climate Change? I created this model for secondary schools. I use experience and I use a game. 
And that's a good match. Astrid, you are piloting this model in your school in Switzerland, but also in other countries. What is the goal of the project? Understanding the relationship between CO2 and the global warming and recognizing the danger of global warming and understanding that CO2 is not going to disappear if I am not talking about it. This is for about six lessons. In secondary schools, the pupils are about 13 to 16 years old. There's so much rubbish floating around in, in the internet. We would like that they recognize effects of climate change in their environment. And we would like that they know options to reduce their own CO2 footprint. And one of the things I would really like is to get the respect for the results of science. And instead of just doing theory, I prefer to activate them with models and with experiments and a combination with pictures and the experiments. In addition to developing your own model, you also use the Climate First Game with your students. What is the Climate First Game? This is a very interesting game. It's a so-called series game, and it's like 42 cards, like greatest hits of the climate report of the IPCC. So it's really IPCC-based knowledge. I use a, f a few cards of these because they can correspond to the experiment. Because Climate Fresk is really engaging for students, it has now more than 1 million participants all over the world and is now available in 45 languages. Astrid uses Climate Fresk as a complement or second stage of her teaching methodology. Let's first hear about the model she is piloting, which starts with the students interacting with a practical experiment. I have I created this model it's six chapters. It's about atmosphere, water, ice and glaciers, soil and vegetation. And one chapter is the climate risk and one is what are we going to do now? You have an experiment and that's like a microcosmos on your table and you're doing this experiment. You have cards and these cards they have on the front page, they have a picture. And in the back, there is a short explanation. These pictures correspond to the experiments. So the cards are the backup of the theory, and they also are a bridge into reality because they show you this tiny experiment on your table is in reality this. So the cards are from the climate first game, right? I used a few cards of these because they can correspond to the experiment. For example, you have two bowls. You have a bowl with floating ice cubes and you have a bowl with a Tupperware in the middle, like a land. And on top of the Tupperware, you have the ice cubes. It's a picture for an Arctis and Antarctis, because in the bowl, you have the floating ice cubes. The water level isn't rising because the cubes are using the same space like the water is after when it's melted. And in the other bowl, you have a Tupperware and a bowl with water. And on top of the Tupperware, you have the ice cubes. And these cubes are melting now and rising the water level. So that's the experiment. And then we have questions and you can Look at the corresponding cards where you see glaciers melting. And on the back sides, it says, because the melting ice with the flooding ice is using the same space like the water, there is no sea level dependency with this. And if we have additional water coming from the ice cubes on top of the Tupperware, your level of water is going to rise. And this is also with two cards exactly explained with a picture from nature. Talking to other teachers around the world, I have noticed that many teachers struggle to help their students make real connections between what they learn in the classroom and what is happening in nature. 
how specific phenomena affect nature in concrete ways, and how everything is interconnected. Yeah, that's always the problem. If you have an experiment, it's very nice for the children or for the pupils. And especially in climate change, we want them to realize what's happening outside. And for that, I'm using the cards. So it's like coming from the microcosmos on the table to the real world. And you also play the climate first game with your students. How does it work in the classroom? At the end of my chapters, I'm doing the whole game with the whole class. That means you have 42 cards and in five sets, you start with groups of five to seven pupils. They get seven cards. They have to lay them out on a table in order what are the causes and what are the effects from it. So you first get like a logical way of what happens. And then you get the second set with new cards. Now you have to look, is this card belonging to this one or is it a new effect we have? There is possibility that you have one cause and three effects parallel. So you have to discuss in the group because the the whole group is always involved. Where can we put this card? And at the end, you get, let's say, two and a half meters of a, a story, the story of climate change. So at the end, you really got a story of climate change on a long table laid out. What is the advantage of developing the lessons in your model before playing the climate first game? You know, they did the theory and the experience before they play the game. And when they play the game, they always remember, oh, this is like the experiments we had, you know, this belongs to this. And it's like a repetition of the whole thing in a very joyful way. It's discussion. It's always active, especially if you have teenies. If, if you tell them for 20 minutes something, they're gone. Their attention is gone. But if they have to discuss about, oh, what's the question? Oh, oh, yes, I look at this card. Oh, this card says, oh, it's that for, for the answer. And then you, after you have the game you play and you recognize, oh, now I have the whole picture. Oh, this was my experience here and this was another one. And now it's three meters table telling this story. A recurrent concern that I see with parents and teachers when talking about how best to address issues on climate education is how to do it in a way that does not generate too much fear and anxiety because that can paralyze students and they might feel hopeless for the futures. I think this is a key issue. When you're finished, you're talking about feelings and emotions. They start to brainstorm, what can we do? So we talk about impact and we talk what everybody could do. And at the end, we make the so-called 30-day challenge. That means everybody is going to write down one tiny piece, what she or he is going to change in their life beginning tomorrow for the next 30 days. Thanks, Astrid. Let's travel to North America where Nicole Swetlow is waiting for us. She will tell us about Compass Education and all their interesting tools. Hello, Nicole, how are you? I'm great, I'm great, thank you. I'm in a, a little uh, beachside Mexican village called uh, San Pancho in the state of Nayarit, in Mexico. So just north of Puerto Vallarta. We're lucky, right? It's the winter, but it is 75 degrees outside and sunny and quite lovely. So so we're lucky this time of year with beautiful weather. Nicole, can you tell us about what Compass Education is? How was this movement created? What were the needs they wanted to address? Compass Education is a sort of global network of educators who have come together because they believe that a flourishing world begins with sustainability in schools. And so the the organization started 12 years ago, and it started when a few educators took a corporate workshop on systems thinking for sustainability and participatory sustainability practice. 
and they were blown away. It's been quite an organic and remarkable movement around the world. So these few educators got together, they started to think about how do we do this, and they worked in the international school space. And in around a decade, the network has spread a lot, right? So there's Compass Educators, there's about 3,000 trained educators in, you know, 800-some schools in 90 countries who use these tools in their everyday curriculum to support holistic understandings of sustainability and the practice of systems thinking in their education space. I am very interested in system thinking, and I think this core approach has attracted so many educators. What is system thinking in a school context, and how does Compass Education want to guide education? I think it is. I think it is, and I think this is one of the challenges around the, the use of some language like this. So all of us are in the world, and we're seeing sort of these tremendous challenges, whether it's climate change or systemic racism or war or mental health challenges that our students are, are facing, right? And, and we look at things like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and in every single one of those, we call for systems change. We call for systems change. We say these words, we talk about systemic racism, and yet we don't teach how to think systemically in schools. And so systems thinking in its most fundamental way is the ability to understand the interconnectedness of all of the challenges that we see, of everything that we do, of who we are in this world. To understand that, and instead of feeling overwhelmed, feeling encouraged because we are able to navigate that complexity in a way that allows us to find what we call in systems language, leverage points or opportunities for innovation and for change. And so systems thinking, and it's most simple, is being able to think and embrace those sort of complex interconnected nature and walk into it in such a way where we're empowered to make change. In education, right, we're constantly saying to kids, you know, you are the future. You know, here you go. We kind of messed it up. Off you go. And we'll say to kids, like, look at this big challenge in the world. Now come up with a solution. And yet we aren't giving students new ways to look at those challenges. We're just expecting your youth is somehow going to come up with some novel solution that we haven't thought of over the last hundred years. And the truth is we have to give kids new skills. We have to give them new ways of thinking about things if we really are going to, in my opinion, do our job and take our responsibility as educators to prepare students for this sort of complex world that we don't know what it will be. And so what we want is to build the capacity to stand in, in that space and feel empowered in it. And that's how we do our work in, in systems thinking. This interconnectedness is something I have been discussing with teachers when talking about well-being or when discussing the need to build learning communities for environmental care, for example. So I like this idea of systems thinking. Now, if you are an educator and you want to follow this approach, what would you recommend? Does Compass Education have tools and resources that other educators can use? We have a toolkit. The tools themselves are, are pretty straightforward and simple. And on our website, there's a free course. It's like 15 minutes to learn the sustainability compass. And you can literally take that course and walk into a classroom and use it. That's, that's the brilliance of the tools. But on the website as well, or hundreds and hundreds of lesson plans on every subject matter that we teach in schools and other educators demonstrating the way that they've used the tools. There's videos on the website that teach also the systems iceberg, which is a very popular systems thinking tool that really supports deeper learning and all sorts of educator sourced resources that are available to you. We provide as well sort of a sustainability framework, a self-assessment for schools. We really have two tools that people use all the time in education that take the idea of systems thinking and bring it into anything that they teach. So really taking sustainability out of the space of it's all about the environment and really helping people understand that sustainability is about many things. And we use a tool called the sustainability compass. And so a compass uses Northeast, South and West 
And we use that tool in such a way where North represents nature, East represents economy, South represents our social practices, and W represents well-being. And we ask people to think about sustainability, recognizing that all of those elements have to be considered. And that's a framework and a scaffold for us to begin to understand that in order to protect the environment, we have to have a vital, flourishing, prosperous economy. We have to talk about taking care of people who, we can't ask somebody not to cut down the forest if they can't feed their families. And so we need to recognize that in our conversations. We need to know that our laws and our governance and our social stability contribute towards sustainable outcomes or they take away from them. And we need to be able to identify that. And we need to look at well-being and recognize that if I'm not okay, I can't do any of the rest of this. So we take really simple tools like the sustainability compass, teach it to educators, and then they're able to talk about anything that they're doing in the classroom, whether it's math or physical education or science or technology or English and use this framework to develop sort of the thinking practice and process for more sustainable outcomes, but also just for deeper, better learning. What ages are the tools aimed at? We use it with four-year-olds and we use it with 18-year-olds and all sorts of different kinds of ways. What I think makes the tools powerful is their simplicity, right? Their adaptability and their simplicity. We don't teach knowledge. I'm not going to teach you anything about climate change. I'm not going to give you any data. What I am going to do is just give you some capacity building schools so that your students have the thinking ability to really frame out any conversation that they're having. And it starts really early. It starts really early to be able to sort of understand the interconnectedness and interdependence of anything that we're doing. In addition to all these resources, you also have teacher training programs and certifications, right? So there's online certification courses to really support educators if they want to dive deeper into this. The Compass Educator Network is is amazing because they're so thoughtful and generous about the work they're doing. And so many of us have been doing sustainability education for a really long time, long before it became sort of a critical thing to do. People were really thinking about how do we do this in schools. And so many, many of the people in our network are school leads, sustainability leads, school administrators, really because these skills have have supported them to be able to bring people along in this change-making work. We've recently opened regional networks that require no compass training. And so you can join a regional network and just begin to talk to these neat people about the work that you're looking to do or want to do. And they'll try in those meetings to share little elements of the tools or ways that you could use them immediately in your classroom. So I think that's an exciting opportunity for any educator in the world. We are currently, as an organization, really interested in finding partners who can support us to deliver these tools to every educator in the world and uh, working hard at, at finding the right partners to do this so that everybody has access to these tools. The challenge in education is that educators have all these responsibilities to curriculum and outcomes, and it's really hard. Most educators feel like, well, sustainability is this other thing, and I can't fit this in. And it has to be reserved for the Green Club and the after school program. And it doesn't. We can support you to integrate this work into everything you do every day, and it's going to make teaching better for you and for your students and more relevant to the challenges that we're facing in the world. And that is good for everyone. Let's head back to Europe to ask Scott Tinkler about tools and advice he'd like to share. Scott is from a teacher's network called TIDE, Teachers in Development Education. Hi, Scott. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Yes, good to talk to you. Tell us about TIDE and how you promote dialogue between teachers. It's a network which is run by Teachers for Teachers, which has been going since, ooh, 1975, would you believe? (laughs) I'm actually retired myself now, but basically the idea is that we need to enable schools and teachers to be creative about the ideas and open out the creativity needed. And what we've been doing recently is asking the question, well, what are the educational implications of climate change, which goes deeper than just learning about climate change. It's about, well, what society is going to change, the world's going to change, and what does this mean in terms of schools 
doing their main business, which is about educating young people and making young people able to participate. We have a magazine called The Elephant Times that goes back to the notion of a fable about elephants and, and blind people. From It comes from India, I think, that people need to see that different people were aware of different parts of the elephant, but you really need to connect and communicate in order to have a sense of the whole. And that the theme of all our work, which is about making connections and also making connections locally and globally. I mean, very often people talk, certainly in England, as if the world is somewhere else and they're not really part of it. That we make connections between issues here and issues in other parts of the world so that that commonality of issues is, is understood. That would be our starting point. Is it open for teachers' contributions? We're always looking for people to contribute to that. And that's a tool for enabling dialogue. That has become our main broader communication now. That dialogue is important. And I think the idea that these issues are fundamentally the same wherever you are in the world is important. And how we encourage young people to be questioning what's going on is important everywhere. Tide also uses a compass similar to the compass Nicole told us about. Tide's compass is more oriented towards youth activism. So the West has a different use. On the development compass roads, we've made natural the north, e economic the east, and social the south. And in the west, we've put who decides. And it seems to me that one, I mean, or to all of us, that one of the areas that's neglected is that dimension of who's deciding. And that, that, that question, young people need to engage with that or have opportunities to engage with that. It's not about peddling a particular form of politics. It's about recognizing that there are political dimensions. The decisions involved are things, obviously the decisions we make individually, understanding sustainability is a relationship between the natural, the economic and the social. The individual decisions made by governments, by companies, by international organizations, all of those are significant. They are key to being able to ask appropriate questions about what's actually happening or what could happen, or, you know, what is the future. It's a small tool, but it works very well. It's mainly used in secondary, but it's been used a lot and indeed picked up by people in other parts of the world, notably in Australia and Japan, for example. Essentially, the activities are about making the complexity accessible so students can understand the relationship between the social, the environmental and the economic. What's important is the activities enable students to generate questions about a particular issue, a particular photo. It might just be a photograph that you use in the, in the core of the thing and that they develop those questions in a way that that becomes a basis for their own inquiry, for managing their own learning and about making connections between different aspects. I mean, obviously different aspects like the economic and the social, for example, but also connections between what happens in the student's own place, in their own city or wherever they live, and what might be happening in another part of the world. Thanks for listening to this bonus episode, and thanks to Scott, Nicole, and Astrid for sharing useful and accessible resources for all teachers. You will find links to all tools and resources that have been explained here in the show notes. I hope you will find them useful. Please write us. I would love to hear what you think about what we have shared here and don't forget to subscribe and engage with us in conversations on social media and also by joining our great WhatsApp group. Actually, we are featuring the discussions that we are holding around neurodiversity. So we are launching a survey among teachers in the WhatsApp group and I will be super happy to share here all the inputs that I have been receiving. A big thanks also to you, Sarah, and the Learning Planet. We hope that the repository could be something that you as teachers use or any other educators can use as a resource to be inspired by or to take ideas directly from it and use them in your context. It was great having you here in this episode. Take also a look at the Learning Planet Festival website, use the features from the Planet repository and help to spread the word about these innovations among your networks.